against a disbelief is called stagnation and underdevelopment. I couldn't find any evidence for so many rational claims, including the nonsensical doctrines introduced by Christian missionaries and Arab jihadists that further corrupted and darkened my society. Yeah. We are trying to battle with witchcraft. They now came up and told us, oh, Jesus saved you. Jesus is the savior of the world. And you go to, you go to another part of the country, they say, she's not Jesus. Muhammad is the, is the messenger from Allah and, you know, is the, is the peak of the whatever, the descendants of prophets that uh, Allah dictated the Quran and he wrote it down. And I should believe it word to word. We have the Bible, we have the Quran, we have traditional. Which one do we believe? So you just confusion. That's what they are causing in Africa and they are causing confusion. Period. And if I say it, if it is blasphemy, so be it. I'm a blasphemer. That's what they're doing. They're confusing us. Let them allow us to look at these things critically and discard them. And if there is anything useful there, we take. If there is nothing useful, discard them and chart a better course for ourselves. But they will back it with scholarship, back it with funding. And because people are poor, people have to. And some Muslims, Christians, sometimes they, they practice both of them. Yes, I began to question them. And of course, they started crumbling like a pack of cards, like a piece of wax on a hot iron. These superstitious, dogmatic beliefs, which people have held, sorry, which have held my people hostage, started melting away on the furnace of critical examination and rational inquiry. Now I ask them, they say, the Holy Land. Christians will tell you, oh, Jerusalem is the Holy Land. Muslim will tell you, Mecca is the, which one is the Holy Land? Oh, okay, all fine, we have Holy Lands. Okay, in between uh, Saudi Arabia and Israel is what? On Holy Land? Yes, if this one is holy, then that means that other ones are what? They're holy. Then how do you know the Holy Land? The boundary, if you look at the map, can you know the difference between the Holy Land and unholy Land? So what, 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 what does this thing mean? And when you ask questions, you don't even get answers. In fact, you, people don't even allow you to ask the question. But we'll keep, we'll keep asking the question because there must be an answer somewhere. So friends, I started from doubting. I started seeing some light. And as God has said, <laughs> I yearned for more light and no light. And I'm still yearning for that light. Because they have to tell me why we have holy lands and not holy land. And what makes a land holy? And what, at what age, what time did Saudi Arabia become a holy land? Before the birth of Muhammad? After the birth of Muhammad? At what date? We held the World Humanist Congress in Oslo. And in front of the Congress Hall, there were some Muslim evangelists. They came. So... They were trying to preach to us and convert us. I think it was a difficult job. I mean, if I were them, I would not advise them to go there. If you want to convert, don't convert to humanists and peace. Look for people from other religion because it's easier to switch from one religion to the other than, than to convert a peace. So, well, they were there. So I met them. So they were telling me I should believe in the Quran. I said, okay. I said, what's that? Is a book? They said, yes. I said, when was it written? They said they didn't know. I said, okay. That you should find the date. When they find the date, when the Quran was written, then they should come. People are preaching. They say you should believe in a book. No date. When was it written? Which day? I told them which one was written on Monday because I'm sure he, he, Muhammad did not write all of them the same day. He must have written them which days and all that. They don't know. And they want you to believe it. Okay, next slide, please. In 1994, I left the seminary and later founded the humanist and skeptic groups in my country. Because I strongly felt that my people needed an alternative to dogmatic religions and, super and superstitious beliefs. Yes, we need a space to ask these questions and figure out an answer out for ourselves. I thought, 
a skeptic group, a humanist group, was a veritable way to remain sane and to sanitize the society. Yes, because there was all this madness going on. And you know, we keep talking about, just like now we went through the, I went through the Catholic indoctrination. I came out. My elder sister is a born again. You know, another one. You know, in the night, oh, before she sleeps, she will be praying. And before you know, she says, I said, what is this? He said, speaking in tongues. But which tongue? <laughs> which, which tongue? He said, I'm speaking in tongues. That is heavenly language. And you listen, you know, you just need to, you know, check your tongue a bit. You, you, everybody can speak in tongues. Do you see it? I said, I'm try, I was trying to comprehend the other one. They now brought the Pentecostal born again speaking in tongues thing. So, additional confusion. So, friends, I felt that was a meaningful way to contribute to the course of enlightenment and intellectual awakening of my people from their dogmatic slumber. Yes. Because I would like a situation whereby I challenge people. I try them. Are you sure? Are you sure you are not either drunk or asleep? You believe this thing? Hopefully, they may realize it and wake up. Well, I knew it was not going to be an easy task. I knew very well from the beginning. My family members, they never gave me any chance at all. They said I would never succeed. They thought it was like maybe I'll get frustrated or I'll get burnt out at a point and all that. I even sensed it because, you know, you are, when you are doing something, at least you are getting people around. Like the way we announced this meeting, one, two, three, four people started coming. said, okay, fine. But this is a situation whereby when you try to sample people's opinion, nobody even wants to think in that direction. So, I knew I could, I could fail or be frustrated. I could even get killed. But I thought that starting a critical oriented group was better than doing nothing. Yes, that was the way I felt. Let me just do it even if I fail. Let me find. At least I would say, yes, I did it for so long and failed. Because I'm one of those who believe that those who peddle dogmatic and superstitious beliefs can only triumph when questioning and critical minds do nothing. Yes, when we keep quiet. When we say nothing. Sadly, not too many people in my country or continent are in support of this idea. Next slide, please. Because for people of my age in my country, and, f and in fact for people of all ages in my nation, for people of my generation, my race, my color, a skeptic is still not a normal thing to be. People don't like answering skeptic. Number one, nobody likes the doubting Thomas. Christianity some somehow demonized you know, people doubting and all that. So if you, want, if you say your doubt is it's like you are, you are like Thomas, and Thomas is not always painted as a good disciple. Why, for me, he was the best. <laughs> the skeptical viewpoint is something not, sorry, the skeptical viewpoint is not something most people, like those of you here in this hall, are proud to identify with. The general feeling is that skeptics should not be seen. They should not be reckoned with. The skeptic voice is irritating and blasphemous, so it should not be heard. The skeptic movement should not be patronized. To most Africans, the skeptic tradition is a Western tradition, not a human heritage. Yeah, so that's how they dismiss it. Oh, you are, you are thinking like the West. You are thinking like white people. They put that wage. Then how, does, how do Africans think? Most people think the skeptical outlook belongs to the white culture, when in fact, this is not the case. So the general belief is that skeptical rationality goes against the norm of the society. The norm of the society as the way to be, the way to live, the way to think, the way to know, the way to act, to react, and the way to behave. So for them, the skeptical outlook is alien to us. Even among the educated, the so-called elite in Africa, the skeptical outlook is a scarce commodity. They don't want to identify with it. They want, they want to be pastors and imams and sheikhs. 
Common sense is not common. There is a disdain for critical thinking. And for them, there's an half in blind faith and dogma. Most people see more sense in nonsense than in common sense or in any skill, any critical thinking skill. In fact, today, the skeptical outlook has very limited space, endangered space, in African cultural and intellectual tradition. Skeptical sentiments are perceived as alien to the mentality, culture, and tradition of the people. The skeptical outlook is seen as being of no good, of no use, and of no benefit. Yeah, why be a skeptic? What is the use? Of, of what use is it? You are a naysayer. You say no to everything. Somebody called me one day on phone. He said, Leo, you are always against this, against death penalty, against this, against the same thing, against everything. You know, that is like everything I'm against and all that. But that's not really the truth. But, but that's it. They will, they will say, oh, you always don't believe, you don't accept, you doubt, and things like that. But friends, <clears throat> this is the reason why today we have few and fledgling skeptic rational, rationalist groups in Africa. But that has not diminished the promises of the skeptical outlook. That has not dimmed the potentials for rationalism in the region. Instead, today more than ever, Africa is in urgent need of science, reason, and critical thinking. Africans need to embrace the skeptical outlook or regret it. Now, why do I say so? There are so many irrational beliefs. And these irrational beliefs are doing a lot of damage to Africa. I'm going to list a few of them. Next slide, please. One is the belief that no one dies a natural death. When somebody dies, they say somebody, no, a neighbor, a family member killed the, the fellow. Often women are accused of killing their husbands and are subjected to in, inhuman and degrading treatment in the name of widowhood rights. They have this thing that when somebody's husband dies, you have to wear black, you have to shave your hair, you have to go on barefooted and things like that. And if it's, if it's suspected that you're the one that killed your husband, what's for you? Sometimes they'll tell you to go and sleep with the cops. And all that. Another belief is that dead people are believed to, to have ghosts which hover around their family and community to haunt the living. There have been cases where dead bodies, sorry, there have been cases where bodies of such ghosts are exhumed and burnt. That this man has refused to settle down in the grave, he keeps hovering around. People will go and exhume the body and burn it. Just to make sure that he, he dies or she dies finally. That is the belief. <laughs> and they will do some rituals around it. What is it? You know, when, just like now, when somebody dies, you have, the, the memory is still there. You can always imagine seeing the person and things like that. Or you can dream and see the person. The worst. They will say the person has not died. The person is still over it. And there's need for to make sure the person has died properly. They will go and exhume the body and burn the body. People believe that death is not the end of life, and that through some rituals, people can talk to and communicate with the dead, the ancestors. There's also the belief that human beings can turn to animals or insects or reptiles to harm others, particularly at night, not during the day. Such suspected individuals are called witches and wizards. That's it. You are suspected to be moving around in the night. You're a witch, you're a wizard. And people can kill you. Nothing happens. The police will not come because they don't want to be involved in witchcraft cases. <laughs> the witch will remain where it is. So that's it. People believe that ritual sacrifice of animals and sometimes humans can be used to appease the gods, whoever they are, whatever they are. It is believed that ritual sacrifice is more effective when human body parts are used. Yes.